Good morning. I love being here. We love seeing your beautiful faces every week. Glad you wanted to roll out of bed and come to church. If you are new here, either in person or online, it's very easy for all you in-person people. All you have to do is pull out this cellular device and scan the connect card on the back of your chair. Or if you're online, I found out from this guy, Mark Ledbetter, who's online. He told me that all you have to do is text connect to the number that should be popping up on your screen right about now. Now I'm gonna hand it off to this tall human being next to me, the other David. I always get a boost of confidence when you're standing next to me. It's always something good. Um, but yeah, good morning guys. My name is David also, and I uh, just wanted to uh, welcome you guys here. I'm on staff here, and the only thing I wanted to mention is uh, through, the, through the month of August, especially at the end of August, we're going to have a lot of opportunities for you to connect here and really plug in if you're newer or even if you've just been here for a while but not really connected. And one of those things that are coming up is on August 22nd, which is a Sunday, we're going to have our next steps class. We have this class every couple of months, but this one is going to be on Sunday right after a Sunday morning service. We'll be in the pavilion. It'll be at 11.30 a.m., and we will provide lunch and child care. Uh, so we just want to make that as accessible as we can to you. The Next Steps class is just a way to find out about who we are as a church and find out ways you can connect. Uh, it's really low pressure, very low key, and will only take about an hour. So if you can set aside an extra hour, uh, we'd love to see you there. And uh, you can sign up at severn.cc slash next steps. Or if you just show up on the 22nd and you want to stick around, you can do that as well. But if you sign up, it helps us know how much food we need because we are giving you lunch. Uh, but that's all we have for you guys. So let's go ahead and worship together. so good to see you all. Let's all just stand together as we worship God and we just thank him and praise him for who he is and everything he's done for us.
Thank you, worship team. And good morning, Severn. How's everybody doing? You know, I'm doing good. Nobody ever asks, but I'm doing good. And I'd like to tell you why. Last night, my wife and I uh, were invited to a little shindig. Uh, And so um, Katie's parents watched the kids, which means that I slept through the night for the first time in seven years. 
Yeah, so I'm just saying, today is me firing on, on all cylinders. If you're new to the church and you don't like today's message, it's never getting better than this, okay? <laughs> Peak performance. Uh, it, we're starting a new series today. Great Sunday if you are hopping in for the first time. We're going to start a brand new series that we're calling Peaks and Valleys. Uh, we're going to look at the life of David, which I know you would have never guessed from the sign there, so I had to say that out loud. Uh, Before we get into it, let me explain the why behind it. If you have been at this church for um, really this year at all, um, you know that for the last several months, we have been um, looking at teachings that were almost exclusively either highly conceptual or highly practical in nature. Before Easter, we did a series called The Kingdom, where we were looking at the parables of Jesus and... um, uh, all of those are very conceptual. I mean, the parables are literally, they're, they're concepts Jesus is offering us by which we can understand what his kingdom's going to be like. And so all those teachings were very conceptual. And then after Easter, uh, we did a, a series called Equipped for about 12 or 13 weeks uh, where we were looking at spiritual disciplines. And um, those are just practices that we incorporate in our lives to grow into the men and women God's called us to be. And so all of those teachings were, you know, hyper-focused on, you know, practicality. And so what I wanted to do, I thought it would be a good idea, building off of that and, uh, you know, to kind of change our diet up a little bit, is to do a sermon series that instead of being real conceptual or practical is highly biographical, meaning it follows the life of a person because there's, you know, you know this, I'm sure you've seen this in your own life, there's just something about human nature that we um, connect most easily to the stories of, of real people. And speaking for me personally, uh, there is... There's no one in Scripture that I find more relatable or, or really more encouraging than, than King David. And the reason I say that is, is uh, David was, if you know anything about the story of his life, um, which Scripture devotes a lot of real estate to, more than most characters. If you know anything about David, you know uh, that when, when David got things right, he got them all the way right. I mean, he is, uh, you know, a shepherd boy who, you know, with all of Israel's soldiers cowering on the sidelines, he's the only one who's got the courage to go up and face this giant that would dare, you know, defile the name of his God and, and the armies of the living God. When he got it right, he got it all the way right, but God loved him when he got it wrong. He got it all the way wrong. I mean, his, somebody said, woo. Uh, and that's encouraging to me that that is still, a, he's considered a man after God's own heart you know, the apple of God's eye, and, um, you know, he had high highs and low lows, and, and I, I think it's really amazing that his prayer life is really chronicled for us to a large degree through the book of Psalms, which we, we just spent a lot of time in, and you can see it. I mean, sometimes it seemed like it was moment by moment. He went from, you know, the mountaintop of joy to the valley of despair, from the peak to the valley, which is why we've called this series Peaks and Valleys, and so my, my desire through this is um, that wherever you're coming from, whether you find yourself on the peak, in the valley, someplace in between, it's probably going to change uh, a few times between today and, and, and when we conclude this series. You know, the hope for this series is not only that, that you'll f- see yourself in these stories, but that m- most importantly, you'll see the one to whom all of these stories point. That's the true king of God's people. His name's Jesus. So uh, today, uh, I know this is, a, this is devoted to the life of, of David, but today we're actually going to begin this series by looking at the story of an individual whose life uh, actually predates David, but is a forerunner to King David. If you really want to talk about the kind of man he was and life that he lived, you, you, you have to begin with the story that we're looking at today. It's about a woman um, that maybe, maybe you've heard of before, maybe you've heard a teaching on before, but probably not. I would say maybe not for most of us. Uh, today we're going to look at the story of a woman named Hannah, uh, who in so many ways is a forerunner of David. And um, we're going to look at one specific sort of chapter in her life that's chronicled for us in uh, 1 Samuel, uh, parts of chapter 1, and also uh, parts of chapter 2. So let me go ahead and read that on the front end. I'm going to be in in, uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 3 to 11 and 18 to 20, and then chapter 2, verses 4 to 5, 8 to 10. Let's go ahead and read that. It says, This man would go up from his town every year to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were the Lord's priests. Whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice, he always gave portions of the meat to his wife, Peninnah, and to each of her sons and daughters. 
But he gave a double portion to Hannah, for he loved her, even though the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Her rival would taunt her severely just to provoke her because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. Whenever she went up to the Lord's house, her rival taunted her in this way every year. Hannah wept and would not eat. Hannah, why are you crying? Her husband, Elkanah, asked. Why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Hannah got up after they ate and drank at Shiloh. Eli the priest was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's tabernacle, deeply hurt. Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. Making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of hosts, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and not forget me, and give your servant a son, I'll give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and his hair will never be cut. There's a joke in there somewhere about my hair, I'm just going to let you make that. Skipping ahead to verse 18, then Hannah went on her way. (laughs) She ate and no longer looked despondent. Verse 19, the next morning, Elkanah and Hannah, I'm probably going to pronounce his name differently every time I read it, and Hannah got up early to bow in worship before the Lord. Afterward, they returned home to Ramah. Then Elkanah was intimate with his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. After some time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel because she said, I requested him from the Lord. And then I want to read two parts of Hannah's prayer from chapter 2. She prayed, the bows of the warriors are broken, but the feeble are clothed with strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who are starving hunger no more. The woman who is childless gives birth to seven, but the woman with many sons pines away. And then verses 8 through 10. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the garbage pile. He seats them with noblemen and gives them a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. He set the world on them. He guards the steps of his faithful ones. But the wicked perish in darkness, for a man does not prevail by, own his, by his own strength. <clears throat> Those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He will thunder in the heavens against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give power to his king. He will lift up the horn of his anointed. This is God's word. <clears throat> I want to begin today uh, just by asking you a question that sort of invites you to get vulnerable Uh, And as is the case with all of my questions, don't answer it out loud. Um, Have you ever experienced what it's like uh, to fail to live up to the expectations imposed on you by other people, or even to fail to live up to the expectations that you have imposed on yourself? That's a rough place to be. If you know what that's like, then the the story of Hannah's life is going to resonate really deeply with you because that's where her story begins. But by by God's grace, it doesn't end there. Because what Hannah's story really is, is it's a a picture, it's an example, and it's a model of somebody who found themselves in that place, um, experiencing all the pain associated with that Uh, but broke out of that place and found freedom from that place. And so her life really is a guide for showing us how we can live free uh, from being controlled by the expectations either imposed on us by others or the ones that we impose on ourselves. And so I want to kind of look at Hannah's story in in three pieces today. I want to look at her sorrow. I want to look at her response to her sorrow. And then I want to look at what she was able to see through the eyes of faith that enabled her to respond the way that she did. And so this is going to bring us to our first theme today. It's not really an idea. It's just a theme. Number one is Hannah's sorrow. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 4 and 6. We already read it, but I'll read it again. It says, Whenever Elkanah offered a sacrifice, he always gave portions of the meat to his wife Peninnah and to each of her sons and daughters. But he gave a double portion to Hannah, for he loved her even though the Lord had kept her from conceiving. Verse 6 Her rival would taunt her severely just to provoke her because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. What you have here is the story of a man uh, who had two wives, Peninnah and Hannah. Uh, Peninnah, on the one hand, is having lots of children, 
Uh, and the main figure of our story today, Hannah, has not had any children. And Penina is going out of her way to sort of mock <clears throat> and taunt and torment Hannah. Uh, and um, it's obviously, you know, making her miserable. Verse 7 of this story says that, that Hannah is so tore up that she's unable to eat. You know, that's something that you may have experienced before. But down in verse 10, my version of the Bible says that when Hannah prayed, she was deeply hurt. If you read that phrase in other uh, translations of Scripture, it'll say that Hannah was experiencing something called bitterness of soul. That's referring to uh, an emotional, psychological, and, and even a spiritual condition in which um, your life has been so robbed of joy that despondency has taken over in the core of your being and is is basically defined every area of your life. This is, you could call this the dark night of the soul. You could call this, you know, a deep emotional, mental, spiritual depression. That's where Hannah finds herself at the beginning of her story. Uh, the first thing that I want to do is explain exactly why that is. And it, and, and it all boils down to, uh, very simply, one word, expectations. Uh, Hannah is unable to live up to the expectations that have been imposed on her by her culture which was for women to have a lot of babies, all right? You may know this, but especially in ancient cultures, women who were having lots of children, and, you know, most specifically male children, but, but really just children in general in ancient cultures, the women that were able to do that were seen uh, culturally as heroes. And before we kind of turn our nose up to that and say that's so primitive and archaic, there are, there are some good reasons for this. Uh, I'll just give you three of them. First off, children equaled economic prosperity. The more kids you had, that meant there were more people to work, you know, in your fields, on your farms, with your cattle, in the, you know, the family business, so that you could grow and expand economically. Uh, on top of that, children equaled future security, because in a, in a day and age when there's really no such thing as uh, social security, having lots of kids was was really the only way to ensure that you were taken care of when you were too old to take care of yourself. But thirdly, and, and, and this is probably the, the most important reason in Hannah's day, um, children equaled uh, national security because they equaled military strength. All right? and, and, and it's just a simple numbers game. Unless the women in a given tribe or clan or, or um, nation or you know, people group were fertile and having lots of kids, then that society experienced constant insecurity. They were constantly at risk of a neighboring group of people with a larger military force just kind of coming in and imposing their will on your people, either destroying you or enslaving you. And so in, in Hannah's day, women that were having children um, were seen with the highest honor. They were seen as people who were living up to the cultural ideal. They were seen as people who were worthwhile. They were seen as people who were valuable, not just in the eyes of their family, but in the eyes of society as a whole. When you understand that, you begin to understand uh, Hannah's pain and the multi-layered nature of Hannah's pain. Because this is not just a woman. She, she's a woman dealing not only with the, the, the pain of you know, the, the, the personal pain, the individual pain of the fact that she wants so badly to have children of her own but can't. Uh, but on top of that, this is a woman who every day of her life, and, 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 you know, a person like Penina is making sure of this, Hannah, every day of her life is saddled with the shame that comes from her inability to live up to uh, cultural expectations, the cultural ideal of the kind of person she should be. And there's nothing she can do about it. Now, the reason it's important to take time understanding that is because when you start to see life through Hannah's eyes, uh, you start to see how universally relatable her situation is because the plain fact of the matter is every culture in history does to its people what Hannah's culture did to her here. What I mean by that is, is every culture in human history has always imposed a tremendous amount of pressure on the individual to live up to the cultural ideal, whatever that cultural ideal happens to be. And so with that, every culture has paninas that come along and either implicitly or explicitly, meaning either non-verbally or as obviously vocally as panina does, every culture creates paninas that are faithful to come into your life and to tell you that you're not living up. Now, in Hannah's very uh, traditional communal culture, 
that message sounded like you're not producing enough children and that's why you don't matter. That's why you're failing. That's why you're inadequate. That's why you don't have worth and value you know, as a person. Our society is not traditional or communal. We are extremely modern and we are extremely individualistic. So the messaging sounds different in our culture, but the pressure is, is, is the same. Now that the message in our culture, you're very unlikely to hear something like you're not having enough children. Uh, now the messaging is uh, you're not pretty enough. You're not skinny enough. Uh, you, you're not confident enough. You're not popular enough. You haven't achieved enough. Your house isn't big enough. Your cars aren't nice enough. Your clothes aren't new enough. You're just not enough. Right? And, and it doesn't matter what demographic you're a part of. I mean, however, uh, you know, young or old, male or female, black or white, eth- regardless of your ethnicity, your socioeconomic status, your educational background, whatever it is, every culture does this to us. Every culture places tremendous pressure on us because every culture has with it uh, the idea of what a, a, a perfect society would look like and perfect citizens that make up that perfect society look like. And historically speaking, cultures are remarkably unkind to people who do not fit that mold. And so Hannah is the story of a person whose life, uh, Scripture uh, picks up in her life at a time and in a place where she has found herself outside the mold that her culture said you have to fit into if you want to fit in at all, and it's causing her all of the pain that it would cause anybody in her position. And so let me kind of reiterate what I said on the front end here. If you, if you know anything about what it's like to fail to live up to the expectations imposed on you by other people, or, or if you find yourself in a place this morning where you have failed to live up to your own expectations, maybe just recently you kind of woke up and realized, I didn't think I'd be here. I had an idea of where I, I, I thought I would be, you know, with, with relationships, with my marriage, with my kids, with my friends. I had an idea of where I thought I'd be, you know, financially or in my career. I had an idea of where I thought I'd be, you know, as, as far as my mentals. You know, I would be more confident. I would be more secure in myself, whatever it is. And you, you, you basically, you failed to live up to your own expectations. I'm just telling you, you know exactly what it's like to be Hannah. This story is written for you. And I'm confident that God has brought a whole lot of people uh, that need to hear this story, including the guy telling it on Sunday morning. So, so the next question is, uh, how does Hannah respond to this? This is going to be our next theme today. It's, it's our second theme, number two. We're going to look at Hannah's response, and I want to look at this from two angles. First off, I want to look at what Hannah does not do, because it's something that, that all of us so naturally do on autopilot, without even thinking about it, uh, and then we're going to look at what, what she does do. First off, what she does not do. Um, Hebrew scholars have pointed out, uh, you know, experts in the, the, the genre of biblical literature known as Hebrew narrative, which is what this, this story is, all stories in, in, in uh, the Old Testament, Hebrew narrative. What scholars will point out is that in Hannah's life, what we're shown here is that she has two voices from outside of her speaking into her life, and both of them are, t- are trying to tell her who she is and what she should be building her life on. All right, one voice is, you, you've already caught, uh, um, caught on to it, I'm sure. One is the voice of Penina. We read this in voice, uh, in voice six, verse six. Her rival would taunt her severely just to provoke her because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving. That's the voice, like we just said, that's representative of Hannah's culture. But there's a second voice in this story. It's recorded for us in verse eight. It's the voice of her husband. He said, Hannah, why are you crying? Her husband, Elkanah, asked. Why won't you eat? Why are you troubled? Am I not better to you than ten sons? If you look at the details, I, I got to point this out because I'm, I'm sure it's probably going to come. In, I was debating about whether, it was not, whether or not I was going to address this. Let me just do this. If you've ever heard Scripture say, uh, or, pardon me. If you've ever heard somebody say that, that Scripture promotes polygamy and Christians now are so inconsistent because the Bible teaches that and nobody does that today, and so that's why you can't take the Bible seriously, I, I'm just going to tell you that's a ridiculously uninformed uh, interpretation of Scripture. Uh, scripture, it, it's remarkably clear from Scripture that God's design for marriage from the beginning was a lifelong union between one man and one woman. Scripture never teaches that polygamy uh, is a good thing. Scripture records all over the place, especially in the Old Testament, that people practice polygamy, but it also faithfully records that every time people practice that, everybody involved was miserable. And this story is no exception to that. And what what you saw here, if you paid attention to the details, is it's remarkably clear that Elkanah actually does love Hannah more than Peninnah. 
which if you think about it, that's probably what has driven Peninnah to go out of her way. To, I mean, it's a little bit sociopathic of Peninnah to make it her life's mission to make Hannah miserable. It's probably because she was laboring under the con, you know, this um, complex that her husband had given her by obviously favoring this. The point is, this is a giant dysfunctional mess that Hannah's found herself in. Uh, and, and what you have here is Elkin is saying, hey, I know that you can't have kids, but you do have my love. Isn't that enough for you? It shouldn't, shouldn't that be enough for you to actually, you know, basically build your life on? And so what you have here is a woman who's dealing with two different voices, both of which are telling her, here's how you can be happy. Right? One, one of the voices is saying, depend on your ability to have children. The other voice is saying, depend on the affection of your husband. The remarkable thing about Hannah is she doesn't answer either voice. If you read through this story, it's really significant that Hannah makes absolutely no reply either to Peninnah or her own husband. And that's, that's this story's way of showing us, that's the Hebrew language's way of showing us that despite the pressure being applied to her from outside of her, Hannah is refusing to build her life, to build her identity, uh, to be defined by either the cultural ideal or her husband's affection. The reason that's really worth noting is because first and foremost, it would have been remarkably easy for Hannah to, to play that game. Right, this is a woman, understandably, in a tremendous amount of emotional and psychological pain. Hear her husband saying, hey, just let me be the most important person in your life. I know that the culture looks down on you, but I actually love you more than your sister wife. Why don't you just let that be the operative principle of your heart? Which, knowing what we know about Elkanah, this is a guy that has no problem practicing polygamy. I'm just I'm going to point out here, that was not a safe place for Hannah to put her heart. Had she done that, that wouldn't have given her what she was looking for. That wouldn't have fulfilled her. That wouldn't have satisfied her. That would have just made her a slave to what her husband thought of her instead of what her culture thought of her. That's not freedom. That's just trading masters. That's just a new form of slavery manifesting itself in her life. And that's what people do all the time. That's what makes Hannah's story, it's one of the things that makes Hannah's story so remarkable, that, that so many of us so naturally and almost subconsciously do what Hannah refused to do here. Let me just give you one kind of uh, anecdotal, cultural example of this. It, in our culture, it's incredibly common, especially for young guys. I'm talking guys in their, you, you know, like late teens, 20s, 30s, even into 40s. It's incredibly common to see young guys, when they go through a breakup, if they don't immediately turn to the bottle or hop into a rebound relationship, a lot of times, especially young men, will shift into this mindset that says, okay, forget relationships. I'm just going to focus on my career. I'm going to be all about that grind. Dollar, dollar bill, y'all. Uh, the reason that you know they shift into this mindset is because they have to post about it every 30 minutes on Instagram. That's how you tell they shifted into that mindset. I just want to point out here that while that looks really mature and that looks really noble, most of the time, maybe not all the time, but most of the time what's really going on underneath that is a mindset and, and really a posture of the heart that says, I didn't get what I needed from another person, so now I'm going to look for it in career success. And I just want to point out that's not really growth. And that's not freedom. That's just a new form of slavery taking over in a person's life. And, and, and usually what happens is we can go, we can, we can spend, we can waste decades of our lives doing that. Thinking that we're growing, thinking that we're progressing, but constantly feeling this kind of tension and this turmoil because what, what we haven't realized is all we've really done is, is we've just traded masters you know, and maybe it was our physical appearance, and maybe it was romantic love, and then maybe it was financial success, and then maybe it was something else. But what we do is we just go from master to master just often enough that we're blind to what we're actually doing. And the point, I say all that to say, remarkably, Hannah doesn't do that. What she does instead is, is signaled for us. It's not going to look like a big deal at first, but it is a big deal. What she does is signaled for us in verse 9 where we read, Hannah got up after they ate and drank at Shiloh. Uh, the reason that, that does not look like a big deal to us is because we're reading it in English instead of in the Hebrew. Um, if you look at the Hebrew word there uh, that's translated that Hannah got up, that's, an, that's a very, um, it's a dynamic word, it's a very significant word, it's talking about a lot more than Hannah moving from a sitting to a standing position. The Hebrew word is, um, it's pronounced kum, and it, it literally means to become powerful or to endure. It's the same word that, that's used when Scripture says that God establishes his covenant with people. 
It's the same word that's being used. And, and when Scripture says that God establishes his covenant, what it means is that God will cause his covenant to remain even in the face of the unfaithfulness and the weakness of those he's established his covenant with. It's basically God saying, regardless of all the variables in life, my covenant will remain constant. And, and remarkably, that same word is being used to describe Hannah here. So basically what this story is getting across is that Hannah is at this point in her life where she's hit this, this kind of rock bottom. Uh, it's an emotional rock bottom. It's a psychological rock bottom. I'm sure it was probably a spiritual rock bottom. Nothing about her life has worked out the way that she had you know, hoped and, and, and planned and prayed and dreamed. But all of that has led her to this place where she, she kind of snaps, but I mean that in a good way, uh, and, and, and she refuses to allow any of these outside voices in her life to tell her who she is or what she's going to build her life on. And, and, and the way that she does that, sort of just in line with that, is, is recorded for us in verses 10 and 11. Hannah does something that we spent the last two months talking about. She prays. We read about this in verses 10 and 11. It says, deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord and wept with many tears. I think that verse is so powerful because it's not saying, you know, Hannah was so sad, but then she got over it and then she started praying. What this is saying is that right in the midst of her life unraveling before her very eyes with that bitterness of soul, with all of that despondency, with all of that pain, with all of that, all the things that, that probably we're all going to experience at some point in our lives, she didn't try to, 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 to clean that up herself. She didn't try to hide that from God or, or put a fresh coat of paint over that. She brought all of that right into the throne room of God through the discipline of prayer. So deeply hurt, Hannah prayed to the Lord, wept with many tears, then verse 11, making a vow, she pleaded, Lord of hosts, if you will take notice of your servant's affliction, remember and not forget me and give your servant a son, I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and his hair will never be cut. Now, at first glance, this looks like a Hail Mary. This looks like a prayer that, that maybe all of us have prayed at some point in our lives where we find ourselves in a tight spot and it's kind of, uh, you know, God, just get me out of this and then I'll serve you. And I don't know how many times we've broken that promise to God. Th that's almost what this looks like on the front end, like she's just trying to twist God's arm. That's not what this prayer was. It's not what it was at all. And we know that because what happened afterward would have never happened if this prayer was just Hannah's attempt to manipulate God. Skip to verses 18 and 20, and, and you'll see something. It says, then Hannah, this is after this prayer, then Hannah went on her way. She ate and no longer looked despondent. That's really significant, that after the prayer, she's eating again, and, and this despondency has left her. 19, the next morning, Elkanah and Hannah got up early to bow and worship before the Lord. Afterwards, they returned home to Ramah. Then Elkanah was intimate with his wife, Hannah. The Lord remembered her. After some time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel because she said, I requested him from the Lord. Let me point this out. If Hannah had just been bargaining with God, you know, trying to manipulate the Almighty with this prayer, then this pattern that we just read here would not have been the pattern in her life. The pattern in Hannah's life, if she was just, if, if the most important thing in her life was still this child, if that was what she was setting her whole identity on, then this is the pattern in Hannah's life. She would have prayed, and then if she got pregnant, she would have gotten peace. After the prayer, she would have been wrapped around the axle with anxiety. She's up, she's down, she's wondering, is God going to answer me? Only after she gets pregnant would she find peace. But you read the opposite of that in this story. What you read here is she, she unburdens herself in the presence of God through the discipline of prayer. And on the front end, verse 18 says, she went on her way, she ate, she no longer, she no longer looked despondent. So what this story is showing us is that on the front end, Hannah found peace even before she knew if God was going to answer her prayer the way that she wanted him to. I mean, how many of us can say we've experienced that kind of thing? That's amazing to me. So what happened here, if you look at the verbiage of Hannah's prayer, when she promises that if, God, if you give me a son, I'll give him back to you, and then she, she says this phrase, his hair would never be cut, she's talking about making her son a Nazarite. Now, if you've ever heard of the Nazarite vow, a Nazarite was someone who dedicated their lives 
to uh, the work of the priests. They worked with the priests and basically lived in or around the tabernacle all their lives. If you made your child a Nazarite, if you made your son a Nazarite, like Hannah promises to do here, you wouldn't see your child for more than maybe once a year, and that was it. Now, consider how significant it is that Hannah makes this vow to God by thinking about all the reasons that women could have for desiring a child in Hannah's day. We, we kind of talked about this earlier. Let, let me give you three reasons why a woman might desire to have a child, specifically a son in Hannah's day. First off, because your child could give you significance. All right, every day in the culture in which Hannah lived, every day women would go to the marketplace with their children and basically their children were their trophies. Their children were these little monuments that, that you know, the, the, the mom could have that, that they could use to say, look, I'm doing what society says I should do. I'm a valuable person. I'm doing my duty. You know, I'm, I'm meeting the cultural ideal. So your child could give you significance. Another thing we talked about earlier, your child could give you security. In your old age, you can't, you know, take care of, of, of yourself. Your child could do that for you. But the third and maybe the main reason that a woman would want to have a child in any day, but specifically Hannah's day, is, is for the sake of love. Having a child that you could love on and, and hug on and kiss and, you know, the child could come running to you and grab onto your legs and you spend time with them and all that kind of stuff. I mean, those are, those are three probably the main reasons that someone in Hannah's position would want to have a child. But, but understand that by, but that by saying on the front end, God, if you give me this boy, I'm going to make him a Nazarite, she's saying goodbye to all of that. That child's life would revolve around the temple. That child that, that couldn't give her significance in the eyes of others because he wouldn't be around her. Couldn't give her security in her old age because he wouldn't be around her. Couldn't even give her love because he wouldn't be around her at all. That's exactly what Hannah's given up here. And so when you understand this vow that she's made to God, you begin to understand what's taken place in Hannah's heart here. And let me, let me try to kind of paraphrase the inner workings of Hannah's heart in, in this prayer. What she's saying is, God, I realize that all my life I've wanted a child, but it's been about me. It's been about me getting some, some deep-seated uh, psychological, emotional, existential need of my own met through this child. It was about me feeling like a worthwhile person, you know, finally being accepted in the eyes of others. And God, if you had given me a child with that frame of mind and that posture of heart, I would have made a slave of that child. That child would have made a slave of me. It would have just been a giant dysfunctional mess. But in this prayer, what Hannah's saying is, God, I still want a child but now it's no longer about me getting my needs met through this child. So if you give me this child, I'll give this child back to you because I now realize for the first time in my life that what I've been looking for all my life is already mine in you. It's not going to be found regardless of what my culture says about me, and it's not going to be found regardless of what my husband says about me. It's going to be found in an ever-deepening relationship with you. That's where Hannah was brought to in this story. And then, of course, miraculously, God actually answers her prayer. But that's why she could have peace on the front end. That's why she's not, you know, living with the anxiety of, is God going to give me what I really want? Hannah knew she already had what she wanted most, what she needed most. That freed her to leave that burden in the presence of God where it belonged. And then at, on the outset of that, miraculously, God actually did answer her prayer. But, but understand this before we move forward to kind of our last theme today. What Hannah did in this story is, is, is maybe... I think it's appropriate to say, well, at least for some of us, that Hannah did something that is the hardest thing for a lot of us, the hardest thing we're ever going to have to do, which is she got to the point where she stopped giving God-like control to any of the people in her, li in, 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 her, in her life. She stopped allowing people to take the place of God because she realized this is a, this is a zero, th nobody wins this game. And, and I would just ask you, take a self-inventory before we move forward to kind of the, the last thing we're going to talk about. Please, please ask yourself, please have the security to ask yourself, how many of the problems in your life are problems in your life because you've yet to do what Hannah did here? I mean, how much of, of, of the bitterness that we experience, the anger that we experience, the despondency that we experience, the anxiety that we experience the dysfunction that we experience, how much of that at the end of the day is just about the fact that we give people the kind of control that only God should have in our lives? How many times do we make 
unwise decisions that put us in unfavorable situations because the functional God of our life has been the approval and the praise and the acceptance and the affirmation and the love of people. It ruins lives. And what happens here is Hannah breaks free from that. Now, if that was a switch that we could flip, I'd have flipped that a long time ago. I I don't know anybody who wouldn't have. It raises the question, how did Hannah do this? And we see an answer to that question in the theology of the prayer that she prays in response to what God does here. It's recorded for us in in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Because, as history goes on to show, this son that God gave Hannah, his name was Samuel, he'd be one of the most important figures in the history of God's people. And um, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, Hannah prays this prayer, which is really a song that she sings in response to what God had done. In this prayer of Hannah's, you see, you'll find two things, clear as day. You'll find a pattern and you'll see a person. And it's understanding that pattern and that person uh, that help us understand why Hannah was able to do what she did so that we can have the strength to do it ourselves. So let me turn over here to chapter 2. First off, I want to look at this pattern. It's found in verses 4, 5, and 8. Hannah prayed, The bows of the warriors are broken, but the feeble are clothed with strength. Those who are full hire themselves out for food, but those who were starving hunger no more. The woman who is childless gives birth to seven, but the woman with many sons pines away. And then down in verse 8. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the garbage pile. He seats them with noblemen and gives them a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. He set the world on them. Now, here's what Hannah is saying here in this prayer. She's saying, I, I can see a pattern. I can see a pattern that I've never been able to see before, and I can see it in my own life. And what she's saying here is that I'm, I'm finally beginning to understand God's way of operating in this world. God's way is, his, his way is a way in which he doesn't work through strength, but through weakness. God doesn't work through riches, but through poverty. That God has this tendency to work not through people who were certain of their own ability, but through those who are sometimes painfully aware of their inadequacy. And, and what she's really coming to terms with kind of looking back on her life in this prayer, is she's saying, I realize now, I mean, I think it's really significant that twice in two verses, this story tells us that God saw fit to make Hannah unable to conceive. It isn't just happenstance. This isn't just, you know, bad roll of the dice. This is something that God ordained in Hannah's life. And what Hannah's saying here is I can now see retrospectively because hindsight seems to always be 2020, she's beginning to understand that if God had not led her into that valley that he led her into, she's saying, if I had not experienced all that sorrow and that pain and that rejection and that alienation and those feelings of inadequacy and that burden and that heaviness and that despondency that came with it, Hannah's saying, if I hadn't been walked through that, I would have never come to know God like I know him now. I would have never relied on him like I rely on him now. And therefore, I never would have found the freedom that I've found now because I know him and I know how reliable he actually is. So she's beginning to see through the eyes of faith this pattern through which God, theologians have called this the great reversal. It's this upside down way of doing things through which God confounds the wisdom and the strength of this world. But beyond this pattern, Hannah's prayer also points forward to a person. You see this in verse 10 where she said, those who oppose the Lord will be shattered. He'll thunder in the heavens against them. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. And this, this is the part I want to draw your attention to. He will give power to his king. He'll lift up the horn of his anointed. The, the most fascinating thing about Hannah's words here, she's talking about a king. The most fascinating thing about this prayer is that when Hannah prayed it, there was no king in Israel. There actually had never been a king in Israel, and Hannah had no reason to believe we were getting ready to get a king in Israel. I mean, the the boy, although she had no idea, the boy that she was giving birth to was Samuel, who would be the prophet that God would would use later on in his life to begin pointing out who God uh, decided to be king over Israel. But at this point, there was no king. And it, 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 it's kind of boggled, you know, theologians and historians and scholars. And it raises the question, well, who's Hannah talking about? And what's happening is that Hannah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is looking forward through the eyes of faith 
to a king that would be God's anointed and would perfectly embody this upside down backwards pattern of salvation that that Hannah's describing here in this prayer. And, and watch this. If this prayer, if, if any part of Hannah's prayer sounds familiar to you, that's because centuries later, a prayer just like it would be prayed by another young woman who had just found herself miraculously pregnant by the work of God. Her name was Mary. And you can read the prayer of Mary recorded in Luke chapter 1. It's a prayer that is directly based on Hannah's words here that she prayed when she found out that she was now pregnant with the Savior of the world, the one to whom all humanity had been waiting for since that day in Genesis chapter 3 when we walked out on God and couldn't come back. And the fact that Mary's prayer was based on Hannah's prayer is the Bible's way of telling us that Jesus Christ is the ultimate fulfillment and the ultimate embodiment of this pattern of salvation that Hannah was beginning to see. Because when Jesus came to this earth, he was the Savior that nobody saw coming. His own disciples that spent three, three and a half years with him still had no idea what it was that he came here to do or how it was that he would accomplish it. And you, you move through the gospel accounts, you know, it's easy for us to look back and see how could they not see it? None of us would have seen it. You know, for thousands of years, God's people are waiting for this royal king, God's anointed Messiah to come and, you know, eliminate God's enemies. Jesus comes here and he's laid in a feeding trough in his birth. He's, he, he lives his life in poverty as a homeless man. The prophet Isaiah said that Jesus had no physical beauty. If you saw Jesus in his day, you would find him physically unattractive. That's how God decided to clothe himself in and among humanity that he'd made. At the end of, uh, of Jesus' life, the, Messiah, the, the anointed king that Hannah's talking about, at the end of his life, when everybody's expecting the Messiah to conquer the enemies of God's people, instead he's betrayed, he's abandoned, he's handed over to wicked men where he's blindfolded and he's mocked and he's spit on and he's beaten and he's ridiculed. Then he's lifted up on a cross and he's executed in one of the most painful and the most humiliating ways that mankind has ever even devised. And in that, Scripture says, that is how our salvation was purchased. And what you have at the cross is, is, is the tangible evidence. It's a hallmark of the uniqueness of the Christian message. Because Christianity, unlike any other belief system in history, has as its central event the humiliation of its God. And so Christianity stands far apart from the, from the teachings of any other major religion or, or belief system, not just because we're told that our God has won salvation for us, but that he won that salvation through losing, that his strength was displayed through weakness, that his victory that we could have never achieved came at the cost of what looked like a defeat to everybody. And what that means for us today, this is what Jesus was talking about all through his life, that in the upside down economy of God, winning would look like losing and vice versa. Up would be down and down would be up. The first would be last and the last first. And what the gospel shows us time and time again, and what your life has shown you, I'm sure, time and time again, is that because our salvation was purchased through weakness, it can only be received through weakness. And for, for the last 2,000 years, the power of God has flown most naturally to and through, not those who believe they're strong, but those who are sometimes painfully aware of how weak and needy they are. Let me call the worship team up, and, and, and we're going to close down with this. Here's what all of this means for us today, and this, this should be so encouraging for somebody. What this means, and this is what Hannah was beginning to see, is that when we find ourselves in positions like the one Hannah was in here, uh, positions where, where we are forced to confront our own weakness, our own inability, our own inadequacy, because our lives have, have, have not turned out at all like we wanted them to or hoped they would and were totally powerless to do anything about it, what this means for us today is that if you find yourself in that situation, you are blessed exactly where you stand. You will not be blessed if and when God leads you through whatever you're going through and gives you what you really want. You are blessed exactly where you stand. Because what Hannah's story, among others in Scripture, shows us is that it's only when God brings us to places like this when he brings us to places where we're finally forced to come to the end of ourselves, that we can finally get to Jesus. And we can finally learn to trust in him and rely on him and depend on him the way we needed to all along. And that is the only, that, there is no, 
There is no possibility for growth in your spiritual life apart from that. As long as Jesus Christ is just an abstract idea to us that we sometimes think about to get a warm and fuzzy feeling, we're not going to grow. It's only when Jesus becomes a reality to us, when, when Jesus becomes a savior to us, when Jesus becomes a friend to us, that we, wait, that we put all of our weight on and rest the weight of our lives on and depend on entirely to take our next step, then and only then are we transformed by the grace that Scripture says is so amazing. This is exactly why the Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9 and 10, what I'm about to read you makes no sense whatsoever unless Jesus died on a cross and was raised for our justification three days later. Here's what the Apostle Paul said. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, catastrophes, persecutions, and in pressures because of Christ. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. All Paul is saying here, all Paul is saying here is my human heart wants so badly for all of my plans to come to fruition. But the parts of me that Jesus has redeemed and are thinking straight in light of eternity, those parts of me know that the healthiest thing for my heart is to be brought face to face with my own weaknesses where I know I can't do this on my own. Paul's saying it's a healthy thing when you're insulted. You've lost the approval of people so you can stop making it your God. It's a healthy thing when we're face to face with catastrophes, when our lives have not gone the way that we planned them to, when our Tower of Babel falls down. He's saying it's a healthy thing when we face persecutions, when we face pressures, when we're saddled with a kind of weight that we can't lift on our own. Because then and only then are we brought to the feet of Jesus. And when we're weak, weak enough to know how much we depend on our Savior, then and only then are we strong. So to everybody here today that this story resonates with, you're just like Hannah. Your life hasn't turned out the way that you wanted it to. You're face to face with your weakness, with your inability, with all of that. I just want to say that if God has brought you to that place this morning, I'm excited for you. Because based on what I see in this book, where he's brought you is where he brings absolutely everybody that he desires to work in and work through. And the best thing you could do right now is what Hannah did in this prayer. Look with the eyes of faith at the pattern of God's salvation in his upside down economy and see the king of the world who died on a cross for you, who perfectly embodies that pattern until you're able to say, yeah, I'm weak, I'm weak, but I'm strong because of Jesus. That's it. That's all. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, Father God, we are so needy. We are so dependent. Your word says that your son Jesus upholds the universe with his powerful word. We don't take another breath except for the word of Jesus speaking over our lives. We forget that so quickly. And we are so prone to looking for what we have already by grace through faith in the name of Jesus out in this world. And I don't know how many more times we need to learn that lesson, but it's, it's, it's probably just one more time. God, would you, bring, would you bring us home this morning? Would you help us to see the sufficiency of Jesus, that he alone can satisfy us, that he alone can carry us, that he has what we're looking for, the rest that we need, the salvation that we need, not just the day that we get saved, but the power to carry us all through this Christian life. Would you help us to see how much we need him to learn to rely on him so that we can learn the greatest truth in the universe, which is that he can be trusted. By grace through faith in the name of Jesus, we ask these things. Amen. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life. All I am, I Trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life. I
Amen. Amen. Isn't it amazing that we have a God whose strength will never fail? Um, I don't know about you, but that's, that's the kind of God that I need at work in my life. And, and before, before we go today, we just want to say thanks. We count it a privilege every time we get to gather like this and really just dial in on the person and work of Jesus. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're just a group of people who are doing our best to, to keep up with the tailwind of Jesus and to model our lives after, after who he is and what he's done. And so um, we're grateful for those of you that joined us today. And, and hopefully you heard something that you'd never heard before about the God that we follow. And um, with that, we, we, we're looking forward to gathering with you seven days from now, and we're going to dig more deeply into the life of David, and, we, and our hope through all of this, Ryan said it earlier, is that we really come to grips with the God whose David life was pointing toward, and that was Jesus. And so uh, we pray that you go in peace. We love you all, and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you again one week from today. <laughs>